Here, in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius, near Naples, is where the Romans invented modern concrete, a material which was to shape the course of their monumental architecture. In this programme, we visit France to explore the stunning Plougastel Concrete Arch Bridge at Brest. We marvel at the breathtaking design of the airport railway station at Lyon. But to discover the Roman origins of modern concrete, we need to start in Italy. Early concrete had been used by the ancient Egyptians and the Greeks, but it was a chance discovery here by local builders using these volcanic soils that led to a critical new development in the history of construction. Concrete is made by binding sand and stones together with an adhesive which is called cement. Early Roman builders had made basic cements using lime, sand and water with some success, but across the bay, near the Roman port of Pozzuoli, builders found that their concrete had a much greater strength than anyone else's. The secret? They discovered that by using sand from the volcano, rather than ordinary beach or river sand, they could create a much stronger material. It would even set underwater. By the middle of the first century BC, the new cement, named Pozzulana after the town, had become a key element of all major Roman construction. The Romans didn't understand the chemistry, but the volcanic sand changed the chemical reaction in the setting of the cement. It's this that gave their concrete its special properties. Their new discovery was a concrete of unprecedented strength, and it heralded a new era, paving the way for some of the greatest buildings of the Roman Empire. This is the amphitheatre at Pozzuoli, the town where the new concrete was first discovered. Begun under Nero and completed just before the famous eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79, the building has stood for nearly 2,000 years. We're here because it has some of the best preserved Roman concrete work anywhere. The amphitheatre is a great oval shape, 149 metres long and 116 metres wide. It could seat 20,000 spectators. It was used primarily for fights between gladiators and wild beasts, which were kept in rooms underneath and lifted up into the arena through hatches in the floor. On first glance, it looks as though the amphitheatre is built entirely from brick and stone. But this is deceptive. In fact, the bricks are largely just a facing. These walls are made of concrete with a tile or a brick facing. The concrete was made in a stiff, wet mix and placed by hand in position. The tiles on the outside and on the inside were to stop the concrete slumping outwards, providing just enough lateral support for the relatively short time it took the concrete to set. That way they could build the whole wall up continuously. Cement actually works because chemical reactions form crystals when water is added to the dry mixture and these stick to everything they touch. It's a bit like wet sugar, which when it dries gets sticky. It can stick a spoon to a saucer, for example, like this one. Like modern cements, the Roman Pozzulana actually absorbs water during this crystallization process, which is why it can set underwater. Concrete gets its strength from the cement, but also from the mixture of stones inside it. Down here, you can see concrete with some quite large stones in it. The different sizes of sands, gravels and stones means that the whole mixture becomes interlocked and dense when it's compacted. The smaller stones simply fit between the larger ones and the cement glues it all together. As well as walls and foundations, 
the Romans realized that their new concrete could bridge spaces. Domes and vaults became less expensive and simpler to construct, leading to a new and grand architecture. To build a vault like this, wooden shuttering would be constructed underneath and the wet concrete poured or placed on top. The shuttering had to be very strong because it had to carry the whole weight of the roof until the concrete had set. Sometimes, if the wooden planks weren't perfectly smooth, they would leave lines in the roof showing where the wooden supports were positioned. In their buildings, the Romans used brick, stone and concrete together for both decorative and structural reasons. But because concrete can be moulded to any shape, it is often used largely as a structural filler, hidden behind brick and stonework. Because of this, the extent of the Roman use of concrete in their monumental buildings is still not well known. Perhaps the greatest advantage of concrete over the earlier building materials, like brick or stone, is that all you had to do was to bring the loose materials to site and mix them with water. Like all construction, even today, the cost of bringing materials from a long distance, like stone from a quarry, can be huge. If you can use local sands and local gravels and mix them together in a bucket, and make a new material that's nearly as strong as stone, but in any shape you want, that's concrete. The Roman process of making concrete wasn't bettered until the 19th century, when a deeper understanding of the chemistry of concrete allowed modern cements to be developed. But the principles of modern concrete are exactly the same, and the next major evolution was to discover how to reinforce concrete to make it even stronger, as we shall see next. During the second half of the 19th century, a new concept emerged, which was to transform the character of architecture and civil engineering, indeed of all modern construction. It was to reinforce plain concrete with iron or steel, creating a new material with properties which combined the best of both. Here in Brest, in northern France, is the Pont de Plougastel, Completed in 1930 by Eugène Fresinet, it broke all records for a concrete bridge. It's an extraordinary monument to Fresinet, a brilliant civil engineer and one of the pioneers of reinforced concrete. It comprises three huge concrete arches, each spanning 190 meters, with a double deck across the top designed for road and rail traffic. The arches are high, too, with a rise of 35 metres in the middle to allow ships to pass underneath. In the 1980s, it was decided that it was too narrow to be upgraded as a motorway bridge, and a new cable-stayed bridge runs over the river nearby, leaving the old bridge for pedestrian and cycle traffic. As we've seen, the use of concrete as a building material can be traced to early civilizations. But it was only during the 19th century that it was realized that by embedding iron bars deep enough in a concrete, they would be protected from rusting, and it would create a material with strength and durability for really large structures. This is a piece of old reinforced concrete, and you can see the steel bars sticking out the end. In fact, they run right along the length of the beam buried inside the stone. These have rusted because they're exposed to the air, but inside they'll be as good as new. Although concrete is extremely strong when it's compressed, it cracks easily when it's stretched. The idea of the steel reinforcement is that it carries the pulling or tensile forces in the concrete. 
It's a very efficient system because the combination of steel and concrete working together is much stronger and stiffer than either of them working independently. The Plugastel Bridge was a turning point in the use of reinforced concrete. Prior to this, it was simply not believed that it would be possible to build a concrete bridge so big. Fresinet argued that a concrete bridge would be less expensive and lighter than a steel bridge. He was also convinced it would be strong enough. By the 1920s, Fresinet had learnt how to compact his mixture of stone, sand, cement and water to make a concrete with a strength of up to 50 newtons per square millimetre. That's as much as some rock and more than twice as much as had been possible at the turn of the century. Reinforced concrete is made by pouring concrete into a mould in which the steel reinforcement has already been positioned. To do this out over the river was a real challenge. He designed a huge wooden arch resting on concrete pontoons, like this, which could be floated out into the river and was used as a mould for the concrete arches, which he built one at a time. The sides of the arch were built out from the bottom, like this, until they almost met in the middle. Fresnay's trick was to leave a gap at the top and to wait for each side of the arch to set. Then, using hydraulic jacks, he lifted the arch off the mould and into its final position simply by pushing apart at the top. After he filled the gap, he constructed the vertical supports and finally finished the deck. And now I'm underneath the deck. This is where the track for the railway would have run if it had been completed. We're right inside one of the big arches, stretching down here right to the bottom. You can see the arch stretching out down there, getting steeper as it goes. It's a hollow box structure. Because it's made of reinforced concrete, it doesn't have to be solid like a masonry arch. These triangular pieces are where the vertical supports for the deck above meet the arch. Down near the bottom of the arch, it really gets quite steep. That's the bottom just there. And that's the sea. The Plugastel Bridge was also the key to another of Fresenet's innovations, for which he's best remembered. After this bridge, he subsequently developed a system of pre-stressing concrete, which gave it even more strength. This enabled the construction of pre-cast units, which could simply be lifted up and assembled in place. And that's the method they used for the new bridge. After nearly 70 years, the bridge is beginning to decay, but we can't expect it to be pristine, and sometimes, like here, the water can get in along tiny cracks and rust the steel bars, which then expand and spall off the concrete. It's a bit unsightly, but it's not serious. Despite its appearance, this is an historic bridge. It's a strong and confident design, a marvellous expression of a bold engineering spirit. 
In building the Plugestal Bridge, Eugene Fresenet had made a huge leap in fulfilling the future potential of concrete. Over the following years, the use of reinforced concrete quickly became widespread. Free to mold the material to their designs, architects and engineers around the world could finally create new shapes which were also inherently strong. More recently, we've come to think of concrete as a mundane, even dull material. Tower blocks and car parks from the 1960s and 70s have put a lot of people off. But it can be quite magnificent. And for me, there's nowhere more exciting to see just what you can do with concrete than here. This is the Satellas TGV railway station at Lyon Airport in France. Commissioned by regional government and the French railways, the building was designed by the great architect engineer Santiago Calatrava. It's a prestige building which cost nearly 15 million pounds, but the result is a station that is simply unique. Completed in 1994, the station was the subject of an international competition. Its importance is apparent from its design and its location. It stands squarely across the main access road to the airport, which has to run straight through it. The complex forms a strategic transport interchange for the whole region, incorporating the airport, a nearby motorway, and the main railway line on which the station stands. To the side are the tracks for the stopping trains, and in the middle are the high-speed TGV lines, these ones here. These through trains run at 300 kilometers an hour, so they're segregated from the others, running in a tunnel to protect the people in the station from the noise and shock waves. Approaching the building, it is immediately apparent why it has achieved such prominence. There is an extraordinary quality to it, a feeling of dynamism and movement, almost uplifting. The whiteness of the concrete mix makes it look even more like a sort of skeleton fused onto the foundations below. Spanish-born Santiago Calatrava studied sculpture while reading architecture and later turned to civil engineering. In a relatively short career, he's become well known for his outstanding design of buildings and bridges, structures which combine the functional and the aesthetic, and which, like this one, have sculptural qualities. Under the great winged section in the centre is the main concourse with its magnificent steel and glass roof. There are some wonderful details. But what I want to show you is Calatrava's use of concrete, and for that I need to find the platforms. Unpainted white concrete ribs stretch over our heads, looking like the vaulted roof of a cathedral but with openings which create dazzling patterns of light and shade all over the floor. You would never have thought of building a white station in the days of steam trains. As we've seen, reinforced concrete has strength in bending as well as compression. And this is where we can see that used to best advantage. The curved shape of the roof, and particularly the tapering props on either side, reflect precisely the forces they're carrying. They're thicker at the top, where the bending forces are greatest. This aspect is why people have commented on the natural quality of this design. 
but to see the whole structure, we need to go outside. The choice of concrete is quite deliberate. It feels solid and substantial, but it also gives the building weight and stiffness to cope with the dynamic forces generated by high-speed trains passing behind that wall. But there are many aesthetic details here too, which are unusual in concrete. These great inclined legs on the outside support the edge of the roof, but their shape is carefully echoed on the opposite side, right along the central wall. It is this attention to detail which really characterizes good design. The handrails show us just what a marvelous material concrete can be. Here you can see the true nature of concrete, reconstituted stone. The finish is absolutely superb, as are all the other structural details. Calatrava is a master of elegant structure, blending art, architecture, and engineering. With the TGV station at Satolas, he has brought the use of concrete forward into an artistic perspective, creating shapes of great beauty out of a material we most often associate with simplistic and functional buildings. In the hands of a master, concrete can be a marvelous material. To take stone and fuse it together with a cement was an ingenious idea. To add steel reinforcement allowed engineers to create a material which was extremely versatile. Made with care and attention to detail, concrete can also be stunningly beautiful. It hasn't all been plain sailing, but here, finally, concrete has come of age. In our next program, we travel to Italy to one of the greatest of the Roman public spaces, the amphitheatre in Verona. We discover the delights of the Victorian Palm House at Kew Gardens in London and admire the spectacular World Cup sports stadium at Bari in southern Italy. <laughs>